Welcome. I do want to thank the Museum of Ventura County and all of you for being here. There are a number of dignitaries. I just want to acknowledge them. They either worked on behalf of or with Mike Bradbury, U.S. Representative Elton Gallagher and his lovely wife Janice. <laughs> Former Chief of Police of the Ventura Police Department, Mike Tracy. <laughs> Former Mayor and current law partner of Mike, Barry Groveman. <laughs> Mike's daughter, Heather. and his lovely wife, Heidi. The Honorable Kevin McGee. The Honorable Vince O'Neill. Former Ventura County Sheriffs, Bill Ayub and Jeff Dean. And former head of the Bureau of Investigations, Gary Auer. I'd also like to acknowledge the current Bureau of Investigation Chief, Scott Whitney. Before us is the longest serving district attorney in Ventura County history. 24 years he led and protected the county of Ventura. An unprecedented six four year terms. He comes from a proud law enforcement family, which Mike will share with you in just a bit. His father was the chief of police for the Stanislaus Police Department. His uncle, the sheriff of Lassen County. Mike is a proud University of Oregon graduate, go Ducks, <laughs> and graduated from the oldest law school west of the Mississippi, formerly known as Hastings. He's also a veteran, having served on behalf of the Army. He's going to share with you his road to the district attorney's office, but I am proud and delighted to share with you a legend, an icon, and someone that I am delighted to call my friend, Mike Bradbury. <laughs> Mike, I want to get right into this. So from a traditional lawman, from a public safety family with a law and order perspective, how did we arrive at the title of this book, Law and Disorder, Confessions of a District Attorney? Can you explain? <laughs> well, for, first I'd just like to say that um, I, th I think the reason Ventura County District Attorney's Office uh, became uh, kind of like a legend was because of the people that I hired. I hired the best and the brightest, and they made me look good. Um, and uh, there's a lot of them here tonight, and I want to say thank you again uh, for making Ventura County one of the safest places in the country. Um, Law and disorder. Back in the 60s and 70s, it was a different world. Um, the police really didn't go to academies. Most of the people I knew in law enforcement uh, had spent two weeks with a break-in officer, and they were out on their own, basically. Um, and uh, none of the rules that most of us grew up with uh, really applied back in those days. It was kind of the Wild West. And so that's where the disorder part comes from. And uh, uh, you'll find that kind of spread out through some of the stories in the book. Uh, so uh, not a very sexy answer, but uh, that's the truth to it. It's just a different, uh, a different time. And speaking of that different time, in this book, which is a remarkable and exciting read, full of colorful anecdotes, uh, really enriching stories. You talk about you as the DA, and before that as a deputy DA, 
going out on narcotics raids, visiting homicide scenes, interrogating suspects. Was that the norm back then? You know, that's the way it was back in those days. Uh, our district attorney, a, a great man, Woodruff J. Deem, uh, who hired young lawyers right out of law school, said, I want you to stay two years, and then I want you to go into private practice. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, it was uh, suddenly, you know, you're out of law school and you have the responsibility for a, a homicide because uh, the cops were having a little bit of trouble in those investigations back then, and the DA insisted that uh, a prosecutor and an investigator uh, be on the scene. And so one of the first assignments I had after the, about the first six months was to go to an autopsy. And, you know, I'm not even sure what an autopsy is at that point, but um, I remember walking in and seeing a headless body, uh, you know, on a slab and a, a head and a pan on the floor. And that was kind of the education that new young lawyers got. Uh, uh, and you'd also go out to the crime scene, uh, which was uh, sometimes very difficult. I remember going to one in here in the city of Ventura, and I walked in and found two dead bodies in the bedroom with um, Richard Hawes, a Ventura police officer who eventually became one of my investigators, and it was two people that I knew well. Yeah. And I, you know, I didn't know where they lived, but I, I knew them. One was a lawyer and the other, uh, his wife worked uh, at the courthouse. And uh, uh, so it was, uh, as I say, it was a different world, it truly was. And uh, you grew up fast back in those days. And again, this happened within six months of becoming a, a deputy, leaving the hollowed halls, halls of, uh, you know, the law school. And suddenly you're in the real world. Uh, one of my dear friends, uh, Bill Patterson's here, and he was a law clerk back in those days too, and he probably remembers some of those assignments. Uh, anyway, that's, yeah. that's the reason. And Mike, you weren't always set on being a DA. From what we read in the book, the first career plan was to become a G-man, is that right? I, uh, my dad, as you heard, was a chief of police. He uh, started out on the Long Beach Police Department when he got out of the Navy, and, and my uncle was the sheriff of Lassen County, and he said, hey, the chief's job's open, you ought to come up and apply for it. And so, uh, uh, at the age of 10, I was living in Lassen County uh, instead of Long Beach, and it was an interesting change of pace. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you got a letter from somebody well, yeah, that we may I, have heard of. When, when I relive some of these <laughs> things, it brings back a little emotion, so I apologize. Anyway, my dad took me to San Francisco to a chief's meeting, uh, and uh, Edgar J. Hoover from the FBI was there and a keynote speaker. Uh, and after he had spoken, he was talking with some of the chiefs, and my dad introduced him to me, and, um, and he said, you know, this young man wants to work for you as an agent someday. And he said... Uh, well, let me get his name and blah, blah, blah. And I'll be darned, the uh, uh, year before I graduated from law school, I got a letter from J. Edgar Hoover. And he said, uh, we're expecting you to apply and blah, blah, blah. And I did, I applied in San Francisco, was accepted, and uh, was all set to become a G-man. That was uh, the reason I went to law school. It was my uh, lifelong ambition and goal. And uh, <clears throat> out of nowhere, uh, a gentleman named Woodruff J. Dean, Woodruff Janice Dean, uh, came to the law school. And a buddy of mine said, 
you've, you've got to interview with this guy. And I said, no, nope, you know, I'm off to the Bureau. And he said, you know, not that you want a job, but the experience is going to be amazing. And so he had an opening, and I had an opening, and I thought, okay. So I spent an hour with Woodruff Janice Dean, and it changed my life forever. Uh, an absolutely incredible man. He was a bishop in the Mormon church, never proselytized for a moment uh, with me or any of his deputies, uh, but an extraordinary leader. And uh, uh, he invited me to visit, and I came down to a place I'd never heard of before, Ventura, California. And he, uh, after the interviews and meeting all these young guys who were babies, he said, uh, give me two years and then go to the FBI, you'll be a better agent. And I said, okay. And 33 years later, I walked out of the place. So. <laughs> Things were different back then. There were circuits, there were branch courthouses, you had municipal courts, superior courts. Can you tell us a little bit about the different branches you visited and the cases you tried? Yeah, as soon as we, uh, we, we were hired as law clerks, we spent three months basically in training and doing, you know, the, the stuff nobody else wanted to that didn't require an actual lawyer in the courtroom mm -hmm. until we got our bar results. Um, and I remember we were all in Oxnard on that day and, and uh, we're calling into the state bar to get results and I was the guy chosen to be on the phone and, and uh, I called in and I said, name? I said, Bradbury, Michael. And there's a long pause. What was that again? Bradbury, Michael. Sorry, nobody by that name. It's got to be there, it's got to be there, Michael Bradbury. And he said, why didn't you say Michael Bradbury first, you know, instead of Bradbury Michael? And he said, okay, you're there. And I went, oh, and I hung up. And then I had six law clerks sitting next to me jump on me and start beating the heck out of me. And it took them 20 minutes to get back in, uh, but everybody passed except one young man who was the brightest probably among all of us and had... Uh, uh, had gone to BYU. Anyway, um, our first assignment, once we were uh, full-fledged lawyers, was to the outlying courtrooms, and that was Camarillo and Oxnard, basically. And they left one deputy in Ventura to handle court trials. Nobody wanted court trials. We all wanted juries. And I ended up with the court trials. And uh, I ran a circuit. I'd go to Port Wanimi, uh, Santa Paula, uh, Simi Valley, uh, all around trying court trials in, in Ojai, where I met the king of Ojai, Judge Love. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so that was kind of the circuit that we ran um, until uh, I finally got assigned to uh, Camarillo where they had two courtrooms. Mm -hmm. They had uh, the first woman jurist, uh, and Phil West, I think, was one of the, the judges that was out there. Uh, and we started trying jury trials uh, there. And I, uh, I remember, I think it was Paul Powers, who was a, a deputy that was a year ahead of us and a, an incredibly fine young lawyer uh, who was in charge out there at the time. And, um, we uh, were arraigning a guy, a little short guy, named Charlie Manson. <laughs> and if you get a chance, that's his mugshot from yeah. his Ventura County arrest. And that mugshot went virtually worldwide during the Tate Law Bianca homicides. Uh, and everybody thought that was a, a mugshot from those uh, arrests because all of the data had been removed, and it was just the picture. But that's how he looked when he stood next to me and the other deputy, uh, and he pled guilty or no contest uh, to the charges and involved uh, uh, some child neglect and things. They caught him on a bus down on Highway 1 
and the child had syphilis in its eyes and all kinds of problems. And so he was, uh, uh, and one of the women with him was charged and he was pleading guilty and a woman came down from Malibu and paid the fine for all of them. And they went out and got on an old bus and went driving down the street and uh, uh, a young deputy sheriff pulled them over because they had a tail light out. And he got on the bus and there was a big curtain hanging between the driver and the rest of the people and he pulled the curtain back and uh, everybody was, let's say, unclothed and doing various things, <laughs> uh, uh, various activities. And so he writes a citation, comes back to the courthouse and he's telling us these stories and I said, well, what'd you think when you pull that curtain back, he said, you know, honestly, for a second, I was thinking about joining them. <laughs> <laughs> so that's some of the earliest memories of, uh, you know, riding the circuit. And when you were riding the circuit, you rode to Ojai, and therein you encountered somebody that went by the moniker of the King of Ojai, otherwise known as Judge Love. And apparently mm -hmm. this judge thought he could declare martial law in the city of Ojai, and you stopped it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk? I had a little help in stopping it. Um, we were each, uh, as young lawyers, we were each given us some special assignments that we were supposed to become experts in. And mine was civil disorder. You know, I thought, great, you know, this will be cutting edge stuff and I should be involved in all kinds of interesting, act. well, you know, there was no civil disorder going on in Ventura County until <laughs> the hippies and the townies started fighting over the, the archways that run along, you know, Main Street in Ojai. And back then, there were arches too. On top of the thing. Well, I forget whether it was the hippies or the townies, but one of them ended up taking some powder out of uh, shotgun shells and they blew up a chunk of the wall to get even with the other ones. They didn't like the, the hippies, I think it was the townies that blew it up. They didn't want the hippies sitting on their wall. And so all of a sudden, you know, we've got uh, bombings going on in Ojai, and I'm called out for the civil disorder aspects of it. I remember getting up there, I, I think I met Chief Alcorn for the first time. Ojai had a small police department just before the sheriff began to police up there. And uh, so I introduced myself and proudly showed my badge. It was the first time I was able to display that badge. And I said, I'm from the district attorney's office. And he said, just sit over there, Sonny, and wait a minute, and I'll be with you when I can. So I sat down, you know, politely, and waiting, and finally he came over and I said, well, I'm supposed to be in charge of civil. He said, you're not in charge of anything. Judge Love is in charge, and he's here. And I look over, and here's this tall guy, and he's ordering the cops around and saying, you know, get some sheriff deputies in here too, and uh, I'm declaring martial law. <laughs> Gee, many Christmas. And so I call Woody Deem, the boss, who happened to live in Ojai. And I said, Judge Love has just declared martial law. He said, he's what? <laughs> and he's ordered the city council to convene. And so he's over there now. And he said, I'll meet you there. So I'm sitting in the back. And Judge Love is carrying on, and Woodruff J. Deem walks in, and you can hear a pin drop. Everything is absolutely quiet. He strides down the aisle, asks the judge to step aside and steps behind the podium. He says, ladies and gentlemen, you have no authority to declare martial law. And told him a few other things, and this judge is leading you astray, basically. And you should ignore him. And then he walks back out and everybody kind of looks around and 
The mayor declares the meeting over. <laughs> they all went home. And uh, that was my first meeting with the king of Ojai, but the next one was when I was trying some cases in Ojai, and there was, uh, I think it was the first time I went out there, and I had about a dozen court trials. Mm -hmm. And the bailiff came out and handed me a list, and I said, and what's this? He said, these are the cases you're supposed to dismiss. And I said, I don't think it's supposed to work like that, is it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and everybody had said, George Eskin was uh, the guy that headed up all the new lawyers. And he said, do not go into chambers with Judge Love. And so the bailiff came back and said, Judge Love wants to see you in chambers. <laughs> So here I'm torn between, you know, DA management and, and this guy that looks like Darth Vader when he puts his robe on and walks to the doorway. And so I said, I'm sorry, I've, I've got to work up my cases and blah, blah, blah. And he says, he wants you to move to dismiss those cases. And I said, you know, I'm going to try them all. And so all of the cases, I tried every one of them. And... Every one of them that uh, was on the list to dismiss were found not guilty, interestingly. And several of them turned out to be friends of Judge Love. Uh, and the ones that weren't on the list were found guilty. And there was one case um, that I recall uh, was supposed to be uh, dismissed, and it was... Uh, something pretty simple, a 415 or something. It was uh, a guy had uh, yelled the F word in front of an 82-year-old woman uh, and was charged with disturbing the peace and things. And so I called her <clears throat> and the deputy sheriff who made the arrest. I had the deputy on the stand and uh, I didn't want that little old lady have to testify to this, so I'm asking the deputy <clears throat> if he could relate what the victim had told him. And he said, well, she indicated that, uh, you know, she was out on her porch and the neighbor came out and was maybe a little intoxicated and yelled the F word. And I said, you know, you're going to have to tell the judge what, and he said, you know, it was just a bad word. And this deputy sheriff would not say the word. So I've got to put the little old lady on, which just killed me. And, you know, ma'am, and how old are you? And she said, 60-something. And I said, and on such and such, and the judge said, excuse me, Mr. Bradbury, you said 60-something, ma'am, just how much something? And she said, well... I said, I think it works out to be about 22 years. <laughs> okay. And <clears throat> keep in mind, I'm just out of law school. I'm a baby, and this is the stuff I'm confronted with. And so I said, well, now I know this is going to be very difficult, ma'am, um, but could you please tell us exactly? He said F you three times, only she didn't use the word F. I mean, the, the letter F. She used the word, and she said it several times. I said, okay, 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 stop. <laughs> and so I was able to, you know, prove the case with her testimony, not the deputy sheriff, but since the case was on the list mm -hmm. of do not prosecute, uh, he was found not guilty in that case. <laughs> so that's what it was like uh, appearing before the king of Ojai. And if I may want to add, add la one last thing. <clears throat> He said, Mr. Bradbury, you're having lunch with me. And I said, oh, no, Your Honor, I've got to get back to Ventura. I've got cases this afternoon. Blah, blah. He said, you're having lunch. I'll make sure you're back in time. And so I got in his car with him. He drove me to his home in Ojai. We had some sandwiches. And then he said, you know, you think you're so damn tough. He said, you come on outside with me. We walk out in his backyard, and there's this big cage it's got two mountain lions in it. A big mama mountain lion and what was probably a cub that's gotten pretty full grown. And he walks in the cage and he starts slapping this old mama lion around on the jaws. 
And he comes out and he says, all right, tough guy, your turn. <laughs> I said, you know, Judge Mrs. Bradbury didn't raise any stupid kids. So, <laughs> so got in the car and came back. And uh, it was, uh, I don't know, a couple of months later, he's sitting in Ventura as well as Ojai. So he's in a court trial. And I'm a, appearing in front of him along with uh, Paul Powers. Paul was a little bit late, and so I was taking his place saying, you know, we uh, need to wait for a few minutes, and, and uh, he just sat there. The judge sat on the, the bench watching the clock, waiting for Paul to arrive. And finally he said, I think you're just going to have to put these cases on, Mr. Bradbury. And I hadn't really looked at him. And Paul comes in the back, up down uh, the aisle and sits down, and uh, the judge says, Mr. Powers, turn around. He said, look at the clock. What time is it? And he said, well, Your Honor, the big hand is on the 12, <laughs> and the little hand is. <laughs> and he said, all right, that's enough out of you. He said, you're late, and I'm going to fine you for that. And uh, <clears throat> He said, what's your favorite charity? And he said, the retarded municipal court judges fund, your honor. <laughs> I, I'm blown away, this guy is amazing. Anyway, at that point the judge says, we're in recess and he stands up and for the first time brings his hand up from underneath the bench and it's all wrapped up. <laughs> he lost two fingers to the mama mountain lion. <laughs> Things are a little bit different today in the courts. <laughs> Speaking of which, you found a book on one occasion, and there happened to be a judge's name in that book, and somebody by the name of Deputy District Attorney Mike Bradbury had to visit this judge in chambers and explain the evidence. Can you explain to our audience what you had to do? Well, again, this was back in the really early days when I was assigned court trials in Ventura as a young deputy. And uh, there had been uh, a, a roundup of prostitutes. Um, there weren't too many in Ventura County, but there was enough to every once in a while, uh, you know, Law enforcement would think it's time that we, uh, you know, let them know that we're watching and blah, blah, blah. So the cases were brought in for prosecution. And uh, one of the supervisors came down and said, uh, you know, those are assigned to more experienced lawyers, but we've been going through uh, the trick books and one of our highly respected and regarded superior court judges' name is in one. And we'll probably be turning over this in discovery later in the week or next week at the latest. And my guess is the defense will make sure the press knows about that name. So we want you to go down and tell the judge what's going to happen. I've never met the judge before. He's a superior court judge, and I, why, why don't you send somebody that knows? <laughs> You're the low guy on the totem pole. Nobody wants to go down and have that conversation. And so I call and make an appointment and go down, and the judge is just this wonderful white-haired gentleman, and, and, oh, come on in, and the secretary's sitting right there, and she's just as nice as can be, and I said, may I shut the door, Your Honor? No, you don't have to shut the door. You know, we don't have anything to hide. Come on in. And so I introduced myself, and, and he said, oh, you're with the latest uh, you know, class of young law clerks, and Woody hires all these great guys, and so welcome, and blah, blah. I said, Your Honor, I said, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but uh, we arrested a lot of you know, prostitutes recently. He says, shut the door. 
<laughs> so I got up, shut the door, and I said, I'm sorry, Your Honor, but your name is very prominently listed in one of the trick books. And you know, it was not unusual that prostitutes would put prominent names in their books hoping that once a cop saw that, that maybe they'd, uh, you know, we don't want to arrest this guy and open that bag of worms. But he sat there for a few minutes and he kind of rubbed his chin and he said, you know, Mr. Bradbury, I've always tried to look at the positive side of things. Maybe I'll get a little more respect at home now. <laughs> well, the following Monday, the defendants all came in and pled guilty. And we never did turn that information over in discovery. And he went on and finished a distinguished career, another three or four years. Uh, and every time we would uh, see each other, he would very respectfully say, Thank you, Mr. Bradbury. Nobody else knew what it involved except maybe, you know, some high-ranking supervisors in the DA's office. And uh, so that's the story. Mike, this is going to surprise most of the audience, family members, former staff, but you have actually been handcuffed. <laughs> and you have been handcuffed in court. What happened and why did you get handcuffed? Well, how many of you law enforcement folks remember Charlie Rudd? I see some hands. He was a great guy, a big tough guy. Uh, eventually became a, um, a detective and, and a good one. But I knew Charlie when I first went out to Camarillo to try uh, misdemeanor jury trials. And I was, he was uh, a transportation officer back then. That meant they transported the prisoners to the courtrooms. And we're trying a guy, and I can't remember what the charge was, but again, it was a misdemeanor. And I was in uh, Judge West's courtroom, and uh, Charlie had transported him out, and Charlie's sitting in the jury box. It's a court trial, and uh, he had fallen asleep. And the defendant was sitting at counsel table, no handcuffs, nothing on his, his ankles, and he's sitting there with defense counsel. Well, he glances over, and it's just before the judge takes the bench, he glances over, and he sees Charlie. And so he gets up and turns and heads for the back door. And so I'm chasing him. And I catch the guy, this is the second time I did this, I catch the guy just as he gets to the door and we're in a big fight and end up down between the, the rows of seats and all of a sudden I'm on top, the guy's punching away, I'm punching away, Charlie wakes up. Charlie had to weigh about 240 pounds then and all of a sudden the world fell on my back. <laughs> Charlie dropped on me with both knees. And the next thing I know, I've got a handcuff around one of my <laughs> And the guy that was trying to escape has got a handcuff on his other wrist. <laughs> so Charlie stood up and pulled us up. And uh, Judge West has taken the, the bench by now. And he said, all right, Mr. Bradbury. Are we arraigning you today? What'd you do this time? Well, <laughs> the first time I was handcuffed. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about running for office. You've been a deputy DA, a chief deputy district attorney, the chief assistant, the number two, and then in 1978, Stan Trom announces he's not going to run for re-election and you decide to run. Take us into that race in 1978. Jack Wood was also running against you as well as some others. Why did you do it and how did you win? Oh. 
Well, I had been around probably longer than anybody else. I was the chief assistant DA. Um, the district attorney, Stan, uh, indicated he wasn't going to run again. He, he realized it was something he wasn't really cut out for. He wasn't that interested in uh, He was a fine lawyer uh, and indicated he wanted to go into private practice. Um, and a good friend of mine, Jack Wood, uh, who was a deputy DA, called me and said, hey, I'd like to talk to you about something. And I said, sure. So I, I met him. Uh, he had been one of the uh, supervising lawyers in our child support division. And he told me, he said, I'm going to run for district attorney, and I'd like you to support me. Hmm. Well, let me, let me think about it. Uh, and then another friend of mine, uh, Jay Johnson, said, uh, Mike, I'm going to run for district attorney. And I'm just kind of sitting there, you know, the number two guy, but never thought about running for office. And uh, then a guy, uh, um, Al Keep, I think, also ran. He was in private practice, very close friend of Woody Deem, and he had been uh, in the DA's office before. And uh, finally, I think it was Toy White, who was... Uh, a young prosecutor said, you know, God, you know more than these guys, you've been around longer, and you know, why don't you run? And, um, and she kind of was the person that talked me into doing it. And so I uh, tossed my hat in the ring, and it was, uh, uh, it came down eventually to Jack Wood and me in the, in the uh, final election, and um, we were at a, big forum one night out in Camarillo, and, and he was very distinguished looking, white hair, looked like the most experienced guy in the world, and he had, you know, half of my experience, and I don't think he'd ever tried a felony. Uh, and so we're in this big debate, and finally I said, but you know, you never even tried a felony case. And he said, it's because you never assigned them to me. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, uh, Jack and I stayed friends through that election, and uh, I asked him to stay on uh, after uh, I had won, and uh, he decided he was going to go on uh, into uh, uh, another area, and went up north, became a deputy DA, and eventually went into private practice. Um, uh, Jay Johnson uh, became a very fine uh, private lawyer, uh, and uh, and I'll keep continue practicing law uh, mm -hmm. as well. So, so that was it. It was. And shortly after your election, um, another individual was elected nationwide, President Ronald Reagan. You met him, knew him well. You were appointed to the Presidential Commission on Drunk Driving. You work with then Attorney General Ed Meese. Can you talk a little bit about President Reagan, your trips to the White House, and also from what we read in this book, you were actually offered a job in D.C. on behalf of the White House Counsel's Office. Uh, I, I met the President through a very dear family friend who was, uh, whose family were friends of my wife's family. Uh, my wife's family from Germany, and uh, Bill Clark's uh, wife was from Germany, and uh, Bill was a lawyer in Oxnard, uh, and uh, very close to Reagan. Uh, Bill ended up on the California Supreme Court, and uh, when Governor Reagan uh, was elected president and went to Washington, uh, Bill went with him. Uh, he eventually uh, became the Secretary of Interior. Um, uh, Bill's father, uh, who had been the Chief of Police of Oxnard, um, uh, chaired my campaign when I first ran for District Attorney. And so the Clark family um, were very close to the Bradbury family and the Gramco family, uh, my wife's family. Um, and uh, um, and so I was uh, 
privilege to fly around with uh, uh, President Reagan when he was running for office. Mm -hmm. And we became very close friends. And he said, I, you know, I want you to come to Washington with me. And um, he was elected in 80. I had been elected in 79. And I, you know, I said, you know, I just can't. I just got elected. I just asked the people to put me in this office, and I can't leave. Mm -hmm. And he, he told me I could come to the White House Counsel's office, which he preferred, uh, or I could go to justice um, and, uh, uh, and take a management position at justice. Um, and, I, um, and I, you know, as hard as it was to say no to President Reagan, I told him I can't do it. And he said, well, uh, I'm going to find a way to have you come to Washington when you can. And I eventually was on a presidential commission and was back there every couple of months. Um, and uh, uh, interestingly, um, John Van de Kamp was a, a great man and a dear friend of mine. And uh, John was the district attorney of Los Angeles for many years. Um, he was elected attorney general, mm -hmm. and not too long after he became attorney general, and, and I campaigned for him, Judge White campaigned for him before she became a judge. Um, and, um, you know, I had people say, I thought you were a Republican. Uh, but, uh, you know, it was the, the individual that I supported, not a party. And uh, so, uh, so I get a call from John Van de Kamp, and he said, I need you to come see me. And so I, I flew up uh, the following week, and we had lunch, and he said, um, you know, there's very powerful Democrats in Washington that are kind of orchestrating my career. Um, you know, they told me they wanted me to run for attorney general and then governor of California and, you know, perhaps president. And John was, a, like I said, a great man, had a great name, great family, and, uh, uh, and it was a possibility. Uh, and he said, uh, the powers that be, the Democrats in Washington have contacted me and said, um, we want you to prosecute all of these people that went with President Reagan to Washington from California because they receive funds to help pay their way to get back there and get settled, you know, to move their family, et cetera. Um, but they didn't report it in California like they were supposed to. And it's a misdemeanor. And we want you to prosecute every one of them. And it'll take down the Reagan presidency. Uh, this is the first time this is being told. Uh, And John says, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And I can't do it. But these are the people that control my future, mm -hmm. politically, and my career. Now, if I have to lose one or the other, that's the one that's going to go. But I'd like to be able to survive this. Would you please go to Washington? and meet with the president and tell him to have his people from California file what we call dunk pro tunk, mm -hmm. kind of even though it's late now for then. And then I can say, you know, they filed late and I'm not going to prosecute them for that. Mm -hmm. And it'll look like they did it on their own, that I didn't have my, you know, hand in this and I can move past this problem, this political problem for me. And I saluted and said, yes, sir. And the next week I was in Washington, D.C. in the Oval Office explaining this. And uh, they said simply, thank you, we will take care of it. And uh, they did. Uh, and about uh, three weeks later, I just got a little note in the mail that said thank you uh, from John Vandekamp. And uh, 
So that's the story. <laughs> uh, wow. John Vandekamp, politics often comes down to hard choices and difficult decisions. They're people that get involved, they want your support, they're seeking your endorsement. And that's what John did when he ran for governor ultimately in 1990. And you knew someone very well at the time who was also seeking to go to the governorship, uh, then Senator Pete Wilson. Can you talk a little bit about that, Mike? Um, well, those of you that looked at the book know that Pete wrote the foreword mm -hmm. to it. Pete Wilson has been a dear friend of mine um, forever. Uh, he's, from the time he was a United States Senator. Uh, when he was governor, he asked me twice if he could appoint me to the bench, once to an appellate court and the other to a superior court. And both times I told him no. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had great people, like I said, that from my office that became judges, but it wasn't for me. I could not sit for eight hours on the bench and watch a couple of uh, sometimes incompetent lawyers argue with each other. <laughs> <laughs> Ventura's blessed with really great lawyers, and this, as, especially our office, but it just was not something I wanted to do, um, although I had the opportunity. Um, Pete and I stayed very close and um, uh, he, um, he called me one day and said, uh, actually Heidi answered the phone and uh, she looked at me and her eyes like this and said, it's the governor. I said, no, it's the governor. I said, well you talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, he said, I, I, I want you and Heidi to come up uh, and spend some time with me. Such and such a date and time was set and we went up. And uh, uh, another uh, good friend of mine, Senator Ed Davis, was there. Mm -hmm. And I had known Ed since he was chief of police and um, uh, another great man. And uh, they said, Ed is getting ready to announce his retirement, and we want you to run for his Senate seat. And then we want you to run for Attorney General, and then we want you to run for Governor. And who knows what'll happen after that. And this is when I'm still pretty young, you know. And uh, he said, we need to know within two weeks. And so I spent uh, a week with Ed Davis and again, it was just something that it, it just wasn't for me. I mean, we wanted to have kids and, you know, we had a great ranch, wanted to stay there. I didn't want to live in Sacramento and I wanted to continue to be district attorney. And so I, I called the governor and I said, Governor, I'm sorry. And it's hard to say no to Pete Wilson, especially being such a dear friend. And at the time he said, I'm appointing you chair of the California Council on Criminal Justice, which was the umbrella organization all of, over all of the justice agencies in California. And I said, you know, we haven't announced that or anything, so take that back and give that to whoever else you want. He said, no, I want you to keep that. Uh, but I said, I just, I'm, I'm not interested in. So uh, uh, he said, okay. Uh, and again, we remained very close friends after that despite me having to say no. Yeah, thank you. You did something remarkable as the DA of Ventura County, Mike, and that is personally try a case as the district attorney. The Campbell case, a notorious serial rapist that went to jury trial and that you achieved two consecutive life sentences in. Can you first explain to us what motivated, to take, what motivated you to take that case and some of the challenges you encountered when you did? Uh, well, I, I love trial work and uh, uh, I had such great chief deputies, you know, Kevin McGee, Vince O'Neill, uh, others that 
could run that office better than I could. So I could occasionally be in trial and not have to worry about managing the office. And I did that uh, uh, several times initially in the, in the first few years. And um, the Campbell case was interesting because we had uh, a series of violent rapes in the county um, and throughout California, and they were all the same MO. They were identical in their fact situation. And, uh, and everybody, uh, all the women described a similar individual as the assailant. So we knew if we solved one case, we would solve them all. Um, <clears throat> and all of the reports came in one day because they had, uh, a, a woman who had been assaulted thought she recognized her assailant on the street and told the Oxnard Police Department and they arrested this guy. And so this stack of reports came in of all of these assaults over a significant period of time. This guy had escaped from prison and uh, uh, had had a very violent career before he went to prison. And so I'm, I was flying to a meeting with uh, the Seattle DA and the Portland DA. And so I took all these files with me and, and I started reading them. And it was uh, just an, an incredible weight. I can't explain it. I, it, more so than any other case I'd ever tried. I'd tried, you know, first degree murder cases, and, but nothing hit me like this did. This just, these women describing their ordeal time after time after time. And um, by the time I got back, I decided that I was going to try this case. Um, <clears throat> and it was interesting for several reasons. The defendant was described by all of the victims as Hispanic um, and spoke uh, with a distinct Mexican accent. Our defendant was Anglo. And the longer he was in jail before trial, because uh, he had, had a deep tan, he became very, very white. And all of my witnesses were identifying an Hispanic, my defendant as an Anglo. Um, and interestingly, once I started trial one day, I'm, I, I would usually get back in the courtroom about one o'clock Court would start at 1.30 and I'd just kind of finish things up uh, and sit there and just prepare myself mentally. And uh, in the middle of the trial, I'm sitting there and I hear click, not the trial, in the, in the middle of this. Uh, nobody else is in the courtroom except me. I hear click, which is the door that is the holding cell for defendants in trial, it comes up between, serves two courtrooms, mm -hmm. and the door pops open. And the defendant steps out, and he looks at me, and then he turns and runs for the back door. And I ran for him, and I caught him just as he got back there, and we had one hell of a fight. And I got him in a, what they call a bar arm stranglehold, and I started choking him out. And I'd had several women testify by now, and I've got to tell you, I kept choking this guy until a deputy sheriff came in the courtroom, uh, the bailiff, and saw what was going on and come over and, and help subdue this guy. Um, the defendant attorneys told the judge that I opened the cell door and tried to kill him. They were half right. <laughs> I didn't open the cell door, but once I had that guy, I was trying to, I was going to make damn sure I killed him. He didn't kill me. Anyway, uh, it ended up in the Court of Appeal, and there was a recess for about three weeks, and the Court of Appeal said, you know, all motions denied, you're back in trial. And so here I am, back in trial with this guy, uh, who looks at me, you know, with murder in his eyes every day. Mm -hmm. He's never said a word in the courtroom. 
we get through argument. The only evidence that I had uh, was that one woman said, I saw some bricks tattooed on his side. And he had the gun tower from Folsom Prison tattooed on his side. I had a lousy photograph that had been taken of it. Uh, and the judge would not let me take another one or have the, the sheriff's office take another one. So I'm stuck with this crummy photograph, but I've got it in evidence. And of course, that's gonna be my, you know, piece de la resistance in arguing identity because they're gonna be arguing, hey, our client's this white guy, you know? He didn't do it. So we finished argument. I had tried to get the judge to order him to show his chest, denied. And we're finished with argument and all of a sudden the defense says, Your Honor, we'd like to reopen mm -hmm. the case and have the defendant show his tattoo to the jury. And I have no objections, Your Honor. I mean, God, that's what I, I wanted. And so all of a sudden the public defender's got a half a dozen people in the courtroom. They've got the defendant up next to the jury box and now I see why all the public defenders are in, they formed a half a circle around him so I can't see anything. What's going on up there? And I look at the judge and I go like this and he goes. So I got up and I walked up just behind these guys and I was, almost arm's length reach from the defendant. And he turns around and sees me, and here he is now proudly showing this to the jury, turns around and sees me, and what does he do? He starts screaming and sounds like a Mexican speaking. Mm -hmm. and the jury's eyes all go like this. And I knew it was over. Um, he went away for a long time and died in prison. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the victims uh, was a great artist and prepared booklets for the kids and worked in my office for a long time, helping the children and stuff like that, um, helping victims of crime. And about three years later, they had gone through a divorce, and I ran into her uh, at uh, a photography store and said, would you like to have dinner? She said, yes. A few years later, we were married. <laughs> so that was one of the beautiful things that came out of a very horrible case. Mike, we talked earlier in the week about everything that you can't leave behind in this job. Uh, it takes a toll. It leaves an indelible impact. As you look back upon your career, how have these cases, these trials, the horrific nature of them impacted you, and how have you endured through it all? I don't think deputies have to go to autopsies anymore. <laughs> you see headless bodies uh, laying around. and um, I think writing the book was a catharsis. Mm -hmm. I, I wrote it and then just put it away for two years and then picked it up again one day and read it and things kind of started resolving themselves. Every cop out there seen a lot worse than I have. Um, uh, and my heart goes out to them day in and day out because they live with all those memories. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, back then we had to go to death scenes and autopsies all the time, and you think it doesn't have an impact. You know, you light up a cigar in an autopsy so the smell cutting the skull off, uh, you know, doesn't bother you. And, you know, you forget about it. You go on with your life. 
But one day, all of a sudden, those things start coming back. And I think uh, writing that book made a difference for me. Um, I, I was able to, uh, to face that, face myself, and um, um, yeah. That and worked. speaking of lighting up a cigar, I think you're referring to Mike McKendry giving you a cigar in an autopsy because you knew from experience the stench that would happen in the room and you wanted to go ahead and mask the smell. Can you just talk a little bit about that, Mike? Well, you know, you either smoked a cigar or you put uh, mentholatum in your nose. <laughs> I didn't like putting mentholatum in my nose, so I, I smoked a cigar. Uh, but uh, it was... Uh, it was interesting, uh, this one case I referred to where it was a love triangle out at uh, uh, Camarillo State Hospital and one nurse, uh, out of jealousy, cut the head of the other nurse off and did it surgically. I mean, it was perfectly done, mm -hmm. nothing wrong. And, uh, and it was in a, a Volkswagen and that body bled out and filled you know, the little area where you put your feet, uh, just filled that with blood. It was uh, a, a pool of blood. It, that person had heart had to keep pumping and pump out every drop of blood. Um, and uh, the body was dropped over Mal Balcom Canyon mm -hmm. and the head, he was taken to the girlfriend. And as he's driving down um, Poli, mm -hmm. uh, a Ventura cop gets behind him and is following him and uh, he thinks that they're on to him. This, and so he takes the head, it's in a bag, and he slings it out the driver's window mm -hmm. over the top of the car mm -hmm. and down into an arroyo. Mm -hmm. And late that afternoon, two little boys walking down the arroyo see this plastic bag and reach in and feel something furry and think it's a puppy. Mm -hmm. And pull the bag back and there is that head sticking up at him. And I got a call uh, and responded there and they were setting up a crime scene and lights because it was getting dark. He said, well, we need the crime lab. Well, the crime lab's finding a body out at Balcom Canyon, so, so they're gonna be late. And I remember like this was yesterday, the wind's blowing, it's dark, they've got, the police have lights set up, and all of a sudden that plastic bag that was, the head was in, filled with wind and began to float up in the air. And it was like this ghost leaving that head. Mm -hmm. And finally one of the cops yelled, get that bag! And thankfully they did because it was crimped in a very unique way and we found crimped bags identical to that in the defendant's home, the residence he used out at Camarillo State Hospital. Um, and he was, uh, he was prosecuted and convicted of murder. And uh, every once in a while, the, the son of the victim uh, sends me a note saying, you know, thanks a lot. Did you have a lot of cases back then out of Camarillo State Hospital? Um, we, we had a courtroom at Camarillo State Hospital, and, and again, uh, when you're that young guy, you know, in Ventura, mm -hmm. brand new, you're the one that gets Camarillo. So uh, we'd go out there once a week, and there would be, um, you know, all these crazies that were uh, in front of a judge. The judge would be there. Public defender would be there, and it was typically habeas corpus or something mm -hmm. because they were being held there and they wanted to get out. And I remember the first time I went out there, as I'm walking in, all these inmates are stopping me <laughs> with their hands out. And you've got to have change because, you know, you've got to keep putting quarters in their palms to get them to leave you alone, walk away. 
And uh, second time I was out there, some guy on the second floor, as soon as I got up there, that's where the courtroom was, ran screaming down the hallway and jumped out the window and broke both his legs. Um, and uh, I remember the judge just saying, hurry up, I want to get the hell out of here. So, <laughs> you know, let's, let's move these cases along. And believe me, I wanted to get out of there too. And it's, uh, it's quite a change to go out there when my son graduated from that university. <laughs> and I remember those old days. I mentioned in the intro. I think we're boring everybody. Half of them are asleep back there. So. <laughs> we just have time for a few more questions, Mike. But one that I want to ask you that uh, we didn't have a chance yet to discuss. I mentioned in the introduction, you're the longest serving district attorney in Ventura County history. Nobody else wanted the job. <laughs> <laughs> your longevity, your leadership, how did you do it? And what made you the icon that you are today in the law enforcement community? You look out at this room, it's a testament to your leadership your strength and the human being that you are. And 24 years is unprecedented. Mm -hmm. How did you do it? Well, would uh, all deputy DAs and former deputy DAs raise their <laughs> hand, please? <laughs> That's what made the office great. We had the greatest people in the world. I, I, For my 24 years, I could pick great people. Yeah. And before that, Woody Dean picked great people. And uh, uh, these are the reasons. It's the reason I love the office and the reason I look forward to going to work every day. And uh, there's the other reason right there. That was my inspiration, uh, my wife. Thank you. In the book, it goes back to the 1960s. It's a treasure trove of trials, cases, anecdotes, experiences. Did you keep contemporaneous diaries, memoirs? Did you rely on preliminary hearing memos? How did you do it? Um, well, as everybody that was there will remember, we did detailed preliminary examination memoranda, mm -hmm. uh, prelim memos that we called them of the facts of all felony cases. And the ones that were interesting, I kept. And I used to enjoy reading them. And one day I thought, you know something? This is where we're gonna go with these stories. And, uh, and they were the groundwork because everything in that book is, uh, is a true story. So that's where they came from. And uh, I'd like to say my memory was infallible but it was. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, as you know so well, you have always been a champion of crime victims. In fact, you started the Ellie Liston Victim Assistance Bureau. Under your leadership and your vision, we continue to serve crime victims throughout Ventura County today. In fact, we now have in our courthouse, courtroom therapy dogs, star, tracker, and comet. They assist victims in some of the most painful chapters, testifying before strangers with the defendant present, staring right at them. They offer solace, they offer comfort, and they give victims voice. And because of your leadership and the bureau that you began, we are able to serve victims through Star Tracker and Comet and through our Family Justice Center. So as a small token of appreciation, we want to give to you Star awesome. Tracker awesome. <laughs> and Comet. <laughs>
These are very meaningful to me. Uh, we have nine dogs, and we, we rescue dogs out at the ranch. Uh, and so this means uh, so much to me. Thank you very much. It means a lot to us, your leadership, and what you do on behalf of crime victims. We also have a challenge coin to give to you, Mike. And because of what you began in our office, we have a family justice center that serves crime victims, 2,500 annually. We'll expand it soon to Oxnard with another one we hope to be in our East County. So on behalf of crime victims and the Family Justice Center, we want to present you with this challenge coin. Thank you very much. You know, again, I just want to say that um, um, what I did well was hire great people. And they're the ones that made Denver County DA's office great. Um, and so our thanks goes out to them as well. And we have some of them here tonight. Uh, uh, and I want to say thanks to each of you. and. Uh, and all of you for being here tonight, and God bless.